it um, just keeps getting about. worse in the media for Facebook. I mean, right now, Sandberg and Zuckerberg are kind of putting on their, their happy face. Do you think ultimately that's going to be a messy split? Well, you know, it's interesting. You see sandbagging uh, taking place there by Sandberg, uh, trying to protect the company at all costs, as uh, it turns out she's really trying to protect herself. Time that she should have put on to working on the fix of the problem was going into uh, deceiving the board and, uh, uh, and hiding information from the public, information that her engineers, their engineers, knew since uh, uh, spring of 2016 about the infiltration of their email systems and about the uh, abuse of, uh, you know, the interference in the elections and, and of course, the, the, the spreading of, of uh, hate mail that's really been awful, the, the, fake, the fake news that's gone out there in Myanmar and other countries where there's been terrible ethnic cleansing. It's gone on for years since the company knew that they had a problem with uh, being able to, to certify and clear information. When they said, oh, no, no, there's no Russian infiltration here and things, that, that was the spring of, of 2016, already in, into the ends of the primary. By the general election, the company fully well knew they were trying to investigate. And uh, a year after that is when the, it starts to leak out, and she's mad. Uh, she attacked. Now, Mark Zuckerberg, with all of his uh, nerdiness and defensiveness, was actually asking some questions that she was seem seemingly trying to suppress, which is terrible. For the board to be mad... Uh, so, and, and then and other information just trickling out. All this while, uh, with, with, by the way, with uh, these press releases that were intended to be diluted and watered down, as we now see in the internal communications, this is a problem. And, and she's not like she was, uh, you know, that, uh, that busy doing the company business. She was out on extraordinarily uh, high in, uh, highly prom uh, promotional tours of her books and everything else, and really just not take... And, and then a smear campaign against her competitors, against Google, against Apple... Some of it fake, some of it just, uh, just setting up these false uh, narratives about being tied in with George Soros and things. You can't believe that she was doing this uh, and overseeing it. And now they find some scapegoats, uh, you know, vice president here or there to take responsibility. She's got to be accountable. She's got to lean in. Yeah, well, she does need to lean in. But this is a listen, when you talk about leadership, as you do every day, Jeffrey, here's the thing. If you become the face of a company, even if you're not the CEO, when things turn around, you are going to be the face of the company and maybe not in the way you want to be. It's, ex it's extreme opposite of what we see in, in the headlines yesterday with Mary Barra. Here are, are two very effective, very high profile, very smart women leaders. Their leadership styles couldn't be any more different. For, for those who believe there's one gender who has a monopoly uh, on disclosure and fairness and sympathy and well, another one which, uh, which is the opposite, it's not true, is what we can see is Mary Barra has taken on a lot of responsibility, uh, quite a heavy burden put on her. I think her company's held to higher standards, and perhaps it has to be. 100% of that, of that loan really was not fully paid back to the government and the auto industry. It was about $70 billion went in, and they, or 79, about 70 came out. So, uh, but still, she has been retooling this company in a most profound way, more than I knew all eight of her predecessors. Uh, and she is far stronger than any of them and, uh, and visionary, but a difficult time. And she's certainly not trying to antagonize the president. No. In fact, she said nice things about economic policy. Well, she's been in the White House a bunch of what we see. Well, and also, listen, she literally is a GM child. She, she, her, her dad worked for GM forever. She went to Kettering University, which is basically the General Motors University. I mean, this is somebody who's been there from, from the beginning here, but she's, she's under, done every job she's, in there. It's, it's, it's in her blood. Her dad was a tool and die maker. You're exactly right. She went to the, what was the old GMI, General Motors Institute, uh, and she's the real deal. She's, she's not in there for any political reasons. There's nothing ornamental about it. She, and, and as soon as she got the job, she winds up inheriting these, this horrible ignition key problem of these fiery deaths. And what does she yeah. do? Unlike what we see Sheryl Sandberg did, she put her A team on it right away. She was coming uh, voluntarily uh, to, to all sorts of forums to try to explain what they knew, what they didn't know, how they're going to fix it. And instead of trying to suppress and hide things, she was taking on this problem quite strong head on. And nobody even thinks about that anymore. They're so concerned about the, the current issues, which, of course, are quite vexing, trying to reposition this company to be in the business of selling rides more than selling cars. And her focus on zero collisions and zero congestion and zero emissions is a very tech-driven investment. Their, their investment, of course, in autonomous driving has been quite successful, but quite don't, visionary. Jeffrey, don't you uh, think that GM's problem, though, is not... Is not sort of business-wise, is political. And here's why. Okay, Facebook is in California. The president knows that that state of California is going to vote Democratic in pretty much every election. He's kind of written it off. GM is different. It's factories, and the men and women who work at General Motors are in places like Youngstown, Ohio, 
Erie, Pennsylvania, the suburbs of Detroit, the, Wisconsin, the places where he won the election. He made promises to those people. And when we see these job cuts coming in some of these areas, like the Chevy Cruz and Lordstown plant in Youngstown, Ohio, Warren, Ohio, really, we, we, that's why Barra is under the microscope. Don't you agree? It's because he's, she's hitting. It's, true, it's where, not her fault. The, where this where is, she's based it, it, is where the president's base is. You know, I think the president may, meant well. He promised more than he could deliver. Uh, this is the CEO of a private company. She's not a politician. She has to trade off her different constituencies and resources and make the best decision as a private sector uh, enterprise leader has to do. Uh, President Trump, he's really never been accountable to others except maybe, you know, his, his, his late father, uh, but nobody else. So this is a whole different role. He hasn't been a CEO of a major public company. But still, you're right about the geographic spread. Ohio uh, and, and Michigan were, were critical, of course, to the Trump victory. And, and uh, he made promises there about no factories being closed. Now, Mary Barra warned over the summer, and particularly this, this one humong humongous plant in, in, in uh, Ohio, uh, Lordstown, that R Senator Rob Portman, Senator Sherwood Brown, they were all brought into it back in June and July when they had to shut down the second shift for forever, uh, at least for, the, for now. And then they ultimately now the first shift is that she explained that in retrofitting to different vehicles, because there's been this huge transformation where, where people don't drive what, well, at least what I drive. I don't know who in this watching the show still, still drives a sedan. I do, and it's an American-made sedan. But my wife and the rest of the world loves to drive these SUVs and crossovers. That's where the business has gone, and this plant can't handle that. So she warned people, but she's not poking the bear. She's not tugging at Superman's cave and trying to create Kate and trying to create a problem. Yeah. This is this. You know, you can take a look at uh, the president's attack, though, on her or GM or on Ken Fraser of Merck or on Harley Davidson or on Nordstrom's or on Nike I mean, it, uh, or on Amazon and trying to whip up a frenzy for the non-U.S. competitors like Alibaba or you know or Honda. That's not what we need to be a champion of, of American free enterprise. We have to work with the companies in the difficult situations they have yeah. and help hey, them Jeffrey, navigate. Hey Jeffrey, before we let you go, I want to ask you this. I want to ask you to opine. Okay, you do it so well. Yesterday's headlines, I watched CNBC all afternoon, Powell blinks. Do you think Jeffrey, Jerome Powell, Jay Powell, the Fed chairman, do you think he blinked to the president or do you think he went on the data? I, I seriously think that he spent a lot of time on the data and rather than worried about the president screaming at him, I think he's much more worried about CNBC's Jim Cramer screaming at him. Everybody remembers that they're not listening explosion uh, from Jim uh, a, a decade ago and they don't want this to happen to them. So I, I really do think that many of the critics, analysts out there were pointing out what the data was underscoring. And actually a vice, you know, another F a Fed board member just a day earlier yep. made clear, Richard Clurita made a very similar comment. So I don't think he's bowing to political pressure whatsoever. I do think he was coming to this real on his term, yeah. as some around CNBC referred to it as, as a rookie mistake, that he sort of overdid it in the beginning. So yeah. I, I am encouraged.